Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're going to talk about the body's own analgesic system. This is the body's own pain relief system in which we experience pain, our body releases certain types of chemicals called endorphins, enkephalins, and dynorphins to help reduce or mitigate that pain. I'm going to try and succinctly tell you exactly how this process occurs. So the first thing we need to talk about is pain itself. Now I've drawn up a spinal cord, cross-section spinal cord, and we can see the grey matter here. This is where neurons talk to each other. We've got the white matter here. These are just the highways that send signals up or down the spinal cord. We've got the mixed nerve where input's coming in and out of the spinal cord. And we've got the dorsal nerve root and the ventral nerve root. As I've told you in the past, the dorsal nerve root is where all sensory information comes in. So this is going to be pain, temperature, touch, all comes in through the dorsal nerve root. The ventral is where motor output comes out. So any type of movement, whether it be motor movement or some sort of visceral movement, now visceral movement is going to be such as secretion of chemicals for example, always comes out the motor side which is going to be the ventral nerve root. So, we've got pain, pain sensory. So, something's happened in which we've experienced pain. I've stubbed my toe, for example. It stimulates nociceptors in my skin. This stimulates this neuron, sends a signal into my spinal cord. So, let's just say it's, uh, I stub my toe, goes up my foot, into my spinal cord, into the lumbosacral region, and it's coming in. It goes to the dorsal nerve root. It goes in and it synapses at the gray horn of the spinal cord. So, dorsal gray horn, ventral gray horn, lateral gray horn. So, it synapses here at the dorsal gray horn, specifically in an area called the substantia gelatinosa. I won't write it down, but I'll talk about some other ones in a second. It synapses with the second neuron here. This second neuron then decussates or crosses over to the other side, goes into this bit of white matter here called the spinothalamic tract, and it ascends up the spinal cord. Now, as it ascends up the spinal cord, here's an important point. As it ascends up, it sends afferent signals to a couple of different areas of the brain. Now, these areas that it sends afferents to include, now, it includes this little area here, which we call this entire area here. It's composed of nearly a hundred different nuclei or cell bodies, and that is called the reticular formation. What's important about the reticular formation? The reticular formation is important for consciousness, sleep-wake cycles, arousal. Why do we want a painful stimuli synapsing and talking to this area? Because what happens when we're in pain? We're awake. We need to be aware of exactly what's going on. We don't want to be drowsy. We don't want to be unconscious. We want to be consciously aware so we can avoid that pain. So it stimulates the reticular formation. As it continues to go up, it's also going to talk to this area here. This is called the hypothalamus. Now we know that the hypothalamus, hypo meaning below, thalamus, this is the thalamus here. The hypothalamus is the master regulator for the endocrine system, but also fight and flight. So that's the stress response, stimulating the release of adrenaline and noradrenaline. The thalamus is the sorting center of the brain. All sensory input that comes in must be sorted at the thalamus. It decides where it needs to go. And you know that our brain at least our cerebral cortex, has a map of the body on it. So there's a map for the toe that I just stubbed. And so this signal from the thalamus goes to that area of the body, goes to the area of the brain, mapped to the body of the toe, and tells it, oh, you've now experienced pain. All right. This little area here and here, this is part of the limbic system. This is called the amygdala. And the amygdala is important in, rega in regards to emotional response. Why do we want to have an emotional response to pain? Because it's emotion that will drive our behavior, which is going to hopefully allow for us to avoid this experience again. So let's just quickly recap. Painful stimulus has come in, I've stubbed my toe, into the spinal cord, synapses with the second neuron in the dorsal gray horn called the substantia gelatinosa. This second neuron then crosses to the other side called decussation, goes into the spinothalamic tract of the white matter, ascends up the spinal cord, 
it will speak to the reticular formation. That's arousal, consciousness, keeps us awake. It also synapses with the hypothalamus, stimulating fight or flight. Also going to go to the thalamus to be sorted to go to the part of the brain that deals with conscious awareness for that foot. Also sends a signal to the amygdala. This is going to be that of emotion. Oh, I don't want to experience this pain ever again. Let's avoid it. All right, this is all ascending pain, but something important happens here. This important thing is that we have a descending signal that goes down to the spinal cord to stop this pain or try to mitigate it. Now it comes from, first of all, it's going to come from the cerebral cortex. It's going to come from the amygdala. It's going to come from the hypothalamus. And all of them send signals to this area here called the periaqueductal gray matter. Terrible name, but it's called the peri, meaning around, aqueductal. That's the cerebral aqueduct. So we've got the lateral ventricles, hollow insides with cerebral spinal fluid. We've got two lateral ventricles, third ventricle, fourth ventricle. Then the tube that connects the third to fourth, that's going to be the aqueduct. So the periaqueductal gray matter, I'll just write PAG, or periaqueductal nuclei, which it's now called. Now, all of these areas, the cerebral cortex, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, will all send these signals to the periaqueductal gray matter and stimulate it. It stimulates the periaqueductal gray matter to then speak to this area here, part of the reticular formation called the Rafe nuclei or Raffi nuclei or Magnus Raffi nuclei. And what this does is they produce serotonin. Now, from the periaqueductal gray matter, we send a signal down. This signal stimulates the Rafe nu the Rafi nuclei, and the Rafi nuclei will send a serotonergic neuron down into the spinal cord. And what this serotonergic neuron will do is it will sign up, so it releases serotonin. It will sign up with another neuron which then synapses with this secondary pain neuron. Now this other neuron is a neuron that produces encephalin. Now encephalin is one of the three endogenous opioids, pain relief chemicals that we release. What are the three? You've got encephalin, endorphin, and dynorphin. In actual fact, you've got multiple encephalins, endorphins, and dynorphins. Here, it's encephalin, and the encephalin will bind to opioid receptors. More specifically, what we're gonna find is that the endorphins will bind to the mu receptor. You're gonna find that the dynorphins bind to the kappa receptor, and that the encephalins bind to the delta receptor, which means here we've got delta receptors on the pain receptor, on this pain neuron, and it stops the pain neuron from sending the signal up. Now, it seems quite complex, but we want this signal from the amygdala, from the hypothalamus, from the cerebrum to go to the periaqueductal gray matter to speak to the raffi nuclei, release a serotonergic uh, send a signal to a serotonergic neuron to release serotonin to an encephalin releasing neuron that inhibits the pain signal from going up. Now you may say, what about the reticular formation? This also sends a signal to the Rafi nuclei to send that inhibitory descending signal. So, bit complex, but this is our endogenous opioid pathway, also known as our analgesic pathway.